In this we're going to look at um, how we used to work out what the charge ions would be or what the valency of an atom was and then we often use that to do things like Lewis structures um, or to work out ionic formulae, things like that. Um, we're going to look at how we used to do it using the old Bohr model of the atom which is the one we went like 281 for sodium but it never explained these ones in the middle with what we call the transition metals, things like copper having a 1 plus and a 2 plus ion, things like iron having a 2 plus and a 3 plus. But zinc's in there, but it only has a 2 plus, yet it makes things called complex ions. So the Bohr model never, it, it conveniently ignored these by stopping at number 20. We stopped at calcium because the Bohr model stopped working for us. So it's about what, how we use the Bohr model to, and the periodic table to come up with these things. And this is still valid. We still need to know this this year. And then we're going to see how we are going to look at it this year so that we can understand those variable oxidation states or those iron charges that are confusing. Um, and then we're going to look at one example in particular, which is iron, so that I can help show you how we do electron configurations now. Because the 281 is really good for a general description. So if we were to talk about why its radius was smaller when it's an iron, for example, the Na plus iron, we can use the Bohr model, the number of electron shells, if you want to call them those we now probably should call energy levels. Um, but this is going to be more valid for when we start talking about why certain ions form or why certain oxidation states exist. Um, okay, so if we remember, the periodic table on the left-hand side, not top of put the numbering, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 18. Those are called the groups. And Mendeleev put them in these groups because they all had very similar chemical and physical, well, chemical properties particularly. Um, and that was a really clever idea because it allowed him to predict, you know, some elements that hadn't been invented yet, uh, hadn't been discovered yet. So he was able to say, well, there should be an element here, and there should be an element here, and there should be an element here. So he could make those predictions. So he came up with these groups, and these are very, very useful for predicting things like ionic charge and to go with that valency. So just to quickly define those two, valency says how many chemical bonds can something make. So that's either by sharing or gaining or losing electrons. How many chemical bonds can it make, maximum? It actually falls apart after you get past silicon, which is not even number 20, but we'll learn about those exceptions later in the unit. Okay. Um, the other way that we use, you might have seen it numbered, is 1, 2, then we've got 3B, 4B, 5B, and so on. And you'll see most periodic tables have got that numbering system as well. And that was basically so that in junior science, we can ignore those ones in the middle and make life really easy for you and say, these ones have one electron in their outer shell. These ones in number two have two of them and so on. We ignored this three. We went to three B and said, these ones have got three in their outer shell. These ones have got four, five, six, seven, eight, oh, except for helium, because it's only got two. Okay, so remember that from junior science and year 11 science. Still remember that. That's still really useful knowledge for you to have because it'll help you predict the valency and, which is in red, and the charge of the ions in blue. You'll notice it's got crosses in 4B or 14 and in 8B or 18. 4B or 14 is carbon and silicon, and we should know that although it has a valency of 4, they all have to be covalent bonds. Four electrons is too many to lose or gain. They have to be shared. Um, and of course, in group eight or B or 18, they have full valence shells, so we say that they don't form chemical bonds. Later in this unit, I'll tell you that some of them do, um, but they have to be really far down the periodic table for that to happen, and I'll tell you which ones later on. But for general, our old rules about the periodic table still hold true. We can still number our electron shells like the or energy levels like this. This is still what we want to do. That explains this information really, really nicely. But what it doesn't do is talk about the transition metals, this area in the middle. And sadly for you, but actually kind of excitingly, I reckon, we have to start understanding this area now, the transition metals. And that, I think, is pretty good because that means we're starting to understand the quantum mechanic model of the atom, it means we're starting to understand some real chemistry, actually, or you know, physical chemistry. So don't forget this stuff, but we're going to build on it now. So as well as being able to describe things this way, we now also have to be able to describe them 
talking about which block the atom is in. And we're going to ignore the bottom one. F block is not when we look at at high school level. Okay, the electron basically the atoms in here are more the physicists' realm than the chemists' realm. Okay, because they are the ones that are radioactive. So we're worried about their nucleus more than their electron configuration. So we don't worry about it this year. If you go on to do chemistry to a higher level, you'll start learning about the F orbital or F yeah, the F orbital. So the electrons in the F block. They're quite funky. They're pretty cool. Um, but well beyond my knowledge. What we're going to worry about is these three blocks here. And we've worried about the red and the black block already in our previous one. We could use the Bohr model to explain them. And actually still can. But it won't be good enough for level three. You're going to need to use the notation, what's called the SPDF notation, for electron configurations to explain them. So if I have sodium, which is found, make sure I get this right, here, number 11, I used to be able to have the 11 electrons arranged as 2, 8, 1. That, that's still pretty good. But actually, now I know it's in the S block, I know that it's valence electron, or electrons, in this case it's 1, because it's got a valency of 1. Its valence electron is in a thing called the S orbital. Okay, and we briefly talked about orbitals um, last week. So an orbital is just an area where we will find those electrons. And the S orbital is conveniently spherical around the nucleus. We know that because it's in the 1, 2, 3rd period, that valence electron is going to be in an orbital called the 3S orbital. S because it's the S block, 3 because it's the 3rd row down, sorry, yeah, third row down, um, which means the third energy level. Okay, so that's where its valence electron is going to be. If I took something like iron, number 26, which is roughly there, it's in the D block. So it means that it's the la its last electrons to be added, as it were, are in the D orbital. Alright, that gets a little bit confusing. I'm going to look at that, um, not in this video, but later on. So it means that it's going to have electrons in 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, and then there's going to be some in the d orbital. I'll get into that in more detail later. So where they are tells us a lot of stuff about them. From building their electron configurations, we then can work out why they have ions of the charge that they have, or oxidation states, or valencies that they have. For example, manganese has got a valency of 5, which is, uh, sorry, not 5, of 7, okay, which is ridiculously big, but actually when we look at its electron configuration we can see why it's got a valency of 7. Manganese also has a valency of 2, and if I do its electron configuration I can easily see why it has a valency of 2 and makes a 2 plus ion. So, we could use the periodic table before, to work out the valency and the ionic charge, and we could write a simple Bohr model electron configuration. And that helped support those two conclusions. Just by where they are on the periodic table. That's still valid, but now we're going to take it a step further. Now we can say, oh, its last electrons, as it were, its outermost electrons, are in the S orbital, or the D orbital, or the P orbital. And what we need to also know about those is how many electrons go in each of them. So in the S orbitals, each orbital can take one pair, so two electrons. And I'm saying one pair on purpose. Electrons are stable when they exist in pairs. So this can take one pair or two electrons. The D orbital has got five different suborbitals in it. So if you want to think of them as pathways, that's a good way to think of it. You know, a path that the electrons can go in. There's five different ones, they exist in pairs, so the D block can take, or sorry, the D orbital can take up to 10 electrons. P, these ones here, can take up to 6 electrons before it's full, 3 pairs. So then it's just knowing how to build it. Well before we went, oh yeah, first energy level, sec or first shell, second energy level, or second shell, third energy level, or third shell, and once they're full, we just kept adding to the next one, didn't we? That's generally still correct. 
until you get to calcium. And then I'll show you how that's different later. I don't want to do that on this video. Okay. So for sodium, the first two electrons have to go in the 1, and I'm pointing at S at the moment, the 1s orbital. Okay. And that can take one, two electrons before I have to start again. So again, we can use the periodic table to help us build this. So it's got 1s2. The little 2 is the number of electrons. So that's our 2 there. Just That's our 2 there. Then I have to go to a new energy level. If I've got a new energy level, then the big number changes. It has to get bigger. So now I'm on the second energy level that I'm going to have to start filling up. So I have 2s, and my s orbital can only take 2 electrons, so I fill it. Because I'm going to get 11 electrons. That's, I'm only up to 4 so far. Then I'm into these ones, the p-block electrons. So, again, it's the second energy level, so I keep the number 2 there. I write a little letter p, and then I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 of them. That's filled up. Well, what's 2 plus 6? 8. There's my 8. Okay, so it's still 2, 8. It's just we're being more specific about how they're arranged. And this will be really important when we look at physical properties, like... Um, ionization energies and things like that later in the unit. And then our last electron is going here, where I predicted. Third row, so it's got to have a 3. S block, so it's got to have an S. And I know there's only one electron left, so a little 1. And that's how we write electron configurations this year. So we've transitioned from this simple, simple method to this more meaningful method. And it's more meaningful because it will tell us more information. It will help us justify a lot of the physical and chemical properties of the elements. Any questions before I turn that off?